All right, everybody, welcome back to another C Mask episode. We've got Nick, Mike, Tim, and me as usual. And today we're talking about the seventh commandment. If you haven't watched the other series of episodes in this 10 commandment series, go check them out. We've been going through them all in detail, just drawing attention to some of the finer points that people don't normally think about. But this one, how complicated can it be, right? Thou shalt not steal. Nick, what's the problem with stealing? It ain't yours. <laughs> and what do we mean but, by that? What does it mean I, for something I, to be yours? Yeah, well, I think it stems from obviously property rights, with which I'm going to defer to Tim on from like a, a legal or a satelian standpoint. But I, I think of it also in terms of like, what's the purpose of speech? Well, it's to accurately describe reality. And uh, stealing is like physical lying, basically. You're, you're, you're claiming that reality is something that it's not. Yeah, that's a great first angle on it. Stealing is like physical lying because um, theft, robbery, it's all contrary to natural law and justice, just like lying is. Tim, wh what does it mean under natural law for something to actually belong to us so we have a right to it? Whew. That's a big, that's a big <laughs> concept. Now, it depends and whether you're talking go. about... <laughs> and it's like when he talks in Ace Ventura, soccer style, <laughs> nicknamed the mule. Uh, yeah, so if you're talking about land, then there's this concept that comes out of the Western tradition, comes even before Magna Carta, about something called a fee simple, the idea of how, how do you actually own the land fully. It's the highest conception of property. It's why when, when people say like, oh, white people stole the land from Indians in north america it's like no no they didn't the indians hadn't had the first idea of what a fee simple was they didn't own the land they just ran around chasing each other playing cowboys and indians and scalping each other you know um so they didn't they didn't claim to own the land and no one could therefore steal the land from them well um when it comes to personality this is a bit different just individual things we own and it's a bundle of sticks, uh, whether you're talking about land or personality, you, you know, your favorite uh, basketball card or whatever. Um, a, the, property rights are a bundle of sticks, meaning it's not just the right to, to quiet enjoyment, which is usually associated with using your own land productively, uh, the right of quiet enjoyment, like from Magna Carta times. But there's also less ability. You know, you, you make money leasing it. There's alien ability selling it. There's the right of exclusion. I mean, that, we all love that, right? Like, get the F off my lawn. Yeah, a la Gran Torino. You know, things like that. It's like, you could do many, many things, and there are many before besides these four. Property rights can't really be algebraically isolated one from another because you get all of them. When you own the land fully, um, in, in fee simple, there are lesser ways you can own it. But the, the the moral problem that's really basic, that's a natural law problem, you know, pre-existing Jesus coming to earth, is that when you're when somebody has, you know, by one means or another earned that property, you are preventing them by by stealing it from one or usually more of their, you know, bundle of sticks rights that they hold. And, and you just, they, they can't, they have the right to alienate it. They can sell it. They have the right to exclude you. Well, you're denying that if you go on their land. So we could talk about how you get that property, how, according to not just like white European culture, uh, but how, according to the natural law, you gain a fee simple over land or how you gain like a, a title to some personality um, that like the native whatever you call them, American Indians didn't, didn't have, I call them all sorts of things, but um, they didn't have this. And it's not just that they had some differing conception of what the law was. It, it's that they literally didn't acknowledge the natural law and they're running around, you know, killing each other and not really claiming fee simple property anyway. They just, they just owned nothing, but were so happy painting with all the colors of the wind. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like a Klaus Schwab book. They, they. I was they just going to say we're headed headed happy. toward that agenda twenty thirty. We're going to own nothing and be happy, boys. Yeah. So, and, are yeah. they stealing from us? Is that is that what's happening covertly? Get your Pocahontas wigs ready. 
<laughs> so the next thing is, like Mike's saying, this is where we're heading to. The connection between property and patriarchy is pretty strong, which is why when you get an attack on the family, one of the things they like to do is make it so that the father, the patriarch, can't hand on property in a very effective way to the eldest son, which was what was traditional. They like to break up all the great estates. And that's been done very effectively in England in particular, Europe generally, because property is basically power in some ways. It's your ability to actually provide for not just yourself, but your family and your descendants too. So thinking about us having a right to property, it's a, a natural law right because it's actually one that enables us to flourish as rational animals in our nature. So you'll own nothing and be happy. This is a crazy idea. What's interesting now is like, how do you even define property ownership? Because even if you have a clear title on your home, you're still paying tax of all yeah. kinds. I mean, it depends on where you are, either US, UK or Canada. We all got slightly different laws. I don't understand. For me, I'm almost starting to think that this idea of property ownership is almost like an antiquated one. I'd really like to know what it was like in Jesus day back then, what property ownership was, if it was closer to actual ownership where now it just seems like we're leasing the land for the duration of our lifetimes. And well, go ahead, Nick. I, I'm going to give a shot at this thought here. Cause it's all coming together at the same time. I'm, I'm not sure if I'll do a good job on it, but if you try and think about how somebody comes to earn uh, money or earn property of some kind. I think money is probably easier. Like, let's say you have um, a, a, you have a, a plot of land and you perform agriculture on it so you can sell crops and maybe animals and you can generate income that way. It's like, all right, well, you have a right to the money that you created, but where did the land come from? Well, perhaps you purchased it from somebody else and then there's sort of this infinite regression back to where did the property itself come from it's like well that was uh an ex nihilo creation by god that was given to adam and adam was given the dominion over this to steward it and so like adam kind of gets the first property rights but it was gifted to him like his authority was given to him by the creator Adam himself couldn't manifest the authority or the right over his property. And everything after that is sort of uh, a fungibility of, of land and money and authority, like social contracts. But if you look at the Old Testament, there was like this obsession with land and people groups. This is the, this is the land of us. This is ours. This is yours. And then we're going to go fight you over it, over A, over B. And it seems to be the case through what was the attempt to be done in America and maybe some of the other Western countries is to like codify a way in which you can transact on the basis of natural law, the acquisition of land in accordance with the same sort of authority that God gave Adam. And what Mike, you're describing with the taxation or even in America and Andrew Tate said this as well. He's like, you don't actually own your house. If you think you own your house, like just piss off the authorities. They'll just come take your house. Even if you yeah. paid cash for it, they'll just come take your house. You don't actually own that. So it seems to be the case that in order to like own something, you have to be in perfect alignment with whatever the natural law is that God set forth through Adam and like dominion of your property. And that has probably has something to do with patriarchy and virtue and, and hard work and so on. And then on the other side of that, you have all the people who are trying to expropriate it through theft, Var various uh, magical litigious ways of theft Um which seems to be like the exact inverse of whatever God set up in the garden. Can I just make three points really quick in, in succession uh, in response to that? Yeah. Okay. So Thomas Jefferson said famously, the earth belongs in usufruct to the living. 
um, I don't know if any of you guys know anything about usufructuary rights, but, but we don't consider a fee simple a usufructuary right, it, it, like water rights. You know, when when water uh, flows and resides through your property, that's a usufructuary right. You have it as long as it's there. Land, we don't actually agree with Jefferson. We say, no, land you can bequeath uh, to your sons. And this is really, really important to patriarchy. This leads me to point number two. The French Revolution and several of the other social upheavals of the last 300 years, Jacobin styled social upheavals. One of the first, one of the top four or five things that they tried to do that you don't hear about much is a probate attack. They uh, disallowed the herding of land to sons. Now, the reason I bring this up is because there are many Catholics out there. Here's part of point number two. Don't know. Some of our heroes, like uh, Hilaire Belloc and G.K. Chesterton, uh, both of whom were in the uh, Fabian Society, supported this and never seemed to, once they quit the Fabian Society, quit their support for a French Revolution-styled attack on probate and wills and devise. Meaning, what well, I think Chesterton had, I, I'm, I, to my knowledge, he never got rid of this attack on the heritability of land from father to son as one of his his five points for how, how does distributism come to be? I've, I've had my clashes over the last six years with the distributists. Chesterton was famously vague about what he wanted to do, but he did have a five part plan and it did involve not allowing the heritability of land from father to son. The people are always asking me, what's your problem with? Chesterton, well, this is legalizing theft to take from a son who is the rightful beneficiary of his father's land. Hilaire Belloc, by the way, was a little less ambiguous. He said, yeah, to do the, to accomplish this distributivism where everyone gets three acres and a mule or whatever it was, um, yeah, the state will have to take from the rich and give to the poor. It's, it's just another form of Jacobinism. So that's why I've never liked those guys. Finally, point number three. Um, lots of people do not know that for Aquinas, natural uh, property was not a natural right. It was a requirement of natural reason, and, and he considered like life and liberty natural rights that's that's concomitant with the natural right. So it's logically required, but it wasn't. It was like just adjacent to the two natural rights that that Aquinas acknowledged, but he never was willing to call property a full natural right even though it's required by man and he defends it robustly as if it's a natural right well and lots of people know the 1891 encyclical the beginning of all social encyclicals rerum navarum by leo the 13th he wrote this thing at a school i attended in rome called the angelicum the dominican pontifical school and he wrote it with two basically ghost authors shadow authors these two shadow authors literally used John Locke's uh, second treatise explicitly. They, they used it. It's in their notes. Um, whereby Locke justifies private property use by saying you're, you're mixing your labor with this tree when you chop it down so it becomes your property. Leo the Thirteenth adds this into Rerum Novarum and says, look, even though, he doesn't say it explicitly, even though Aquinas never acknowledged private property ownership as a fully natural right, it was natural right adjacent. I'm moving it in Catholic social teaching here in Rerum Navarum and another encyclical he wrote a year later into you know the, the domain of natural rights. And I'm doing so on the basis of Locke's second treatise. Lots of people in, in Catholic circles today that just get in, educated through the internet know it's popular to be more distributist adjacent and very, very popular to be anti-Locke and Locke's second treatise. But this is a fact. We have as Roman Catholics, the rules that we have about theft and conversely, countervailingly property because of John Locke and Leo the 13th modifying Thomas Aquinas. So this is all really, really important stuff that, that a, a father can um, um, devise land to his sons. And if some of the Catholics had their way, they would have given in to the Jacobins of the last 300 years. You mentioned so good. Uh, the Fabians and... Google has conveniently scrubbed their credo from at least the first page. 
Um, but are you, are you guys familiar with the stained glass window of the Fabians? No. Fabian Society? No. It's, um, it's a bunch of blacksmith-looking guys, and they have the world on an anvil, and they're smashing it. And their credo is um, something to the effect of uh, we must smash the world in order to rebuild it in our image. Hmm. And as you're talking about that, these people like Hilaire Belloc and so forth were Fabian socialists. I find it interesting that what better way to ensure that the world is remade in the image of the elites and the powerful than to make sure that patriarchs can't preserve their property from father to son. If you have a death tax and a state tax, if you rip all this away and redistribute it, then the people who have had power for the last five centuries are going to be the ones who get to decide what happens in the next five centuries. Yeah. Yeah. Even St. Augustine says, if taxation becomes too high, it's like being ravaged by a beast on the road. And uh, Aquinas cites this, and of course, the, the school of Solomonkin, Jesuits, before they were Jesuits, the, the, the based ones, um, um, you know, associated with the school of Salamanca that really, really were influential in um, helping to wire what, what we call small government today into the English-speaking world it comes from the Spanish school of Salamanca, uh, lots of lots of um, famous Jesuits associated with it, really operated on this principle that, that taxation is usually in danger of becoming theft if it becomes too high because of the principles we've talked about. Mm -hmm. Men need property for their families. And if you take it, you're really interfering with their life and their liberty. Yep. I, I really wanted to get this point out that property and patriarchy are connected. And you guys have developed it even better than I was hoping you would. And it's interesting that I don't know about where you are, but in the UK, you know, if you're a a guy who's the sole provider for a family and you're working hard and you get into six figures, you face an effective 60% tax rate. If you just Great. say, I'm not going to do any more and send your wife out to work and you both earn 50, say, you're about 20 grand a year better off. So it's weaponized against the patriarch, not just in terms of inheritance tax and trying to keep the estate together, but even just living the way that you should be living. So property, patriarchy, those two things go together. And I wanted to talk a bit about debt as well, because mm -hmm. the next question in the Baltimore Catechism is, what are we commanded by the seventh commandment? By the seventh commandment, we are commanded to respect what belongs to others, to live up to our business agreements, and to pay our just debts. And there's a note saying that it is sinful to incur willfully debt beyond one's ability to pay. Mm. And it's interesting if you look at the UK, US, I'm sure Canada as well, people are getting into more and more debt. And on my old Twitter account, which got nuked, one of the points that I made was that if you if you live by usury, you're going to die by usury. Mm -hmm. And they weaponize that weakness. They weaponize vice against you. If you want to, we don't know who they are, but if you want to go play that game and enter that arena, then you pay the price for it, basically. So people who are living beyond their means and incurring all these debts, that's contrary to Seventh Commandment. Like It actually encourages virtuous living for you to live within your means, because then you can be stronger. Have you thought about this proliferation of debt, Mike, and how it's been used to weaken men? Oh, it absolutely has been used to weaken men, because now all of a sudden you have accesses to luxuries that your current income level or bracket otherwise would have never had access to. Honestly, I think it's a, a pretty good social or even just in general IQ score um, or test to ask <laughs> a man, you know, um, hey, man, do you own your vehicle? And if not, like, what's your car payment? And you'll be absolutely gobsmacked yeah. by they're like the equivalent of mortgage payments. And I I've never seen a utility for this because there are plenty of good you know vehicles you can save up for and, and, and buy in straight cash. Now, when it comes to not... Um, accumulating any debt is there anything scripture or church teaching regarding debt that you're able to service within your means like a home 
like a mortgage, for example. Not not all interest is usury. I don't think there's an official percentage, right, Tim, in in church teaching where usury becomes usury, but excessive. Mm. Well, but th this is one of those changes that uh, that I think are licit um, to the terminological. Um, ramifications of usury um, as maybe the introduction of fiat currency became a thing. I don't know, because I think Benedict 15, Benedict 15, or maybe it's Benedict 14, because it was further back. I think it was Benedict the 14th, did an encyclical strongly, strongly implying that all interest is usurious. And then this changes um, you know, basically with the introduction of fiat currency that the, the all the, the Merriam-Webster's dictionaries and all the dictionaries in the world, including those that are ostensibly used by Catholics change and they, they start saying, well, yeah, usury is still a sin, but now it's not the charging of any interest it's the charging of too much interest. And of course, this is a loaded term. So no, we don't we don't know how much is too much, especially mm. given that history. We'll yep. look at the fallout that's happened since COVID when interest rates were rock bottom. And, you know, we purchased our first home around this time. And I, I knew, I'm like, listen, like these times are not going to last. This is manufactured luxury where people are going to swarm into the market and overextend themselves with mortgage debts that they cannot service over the long haul. And when they go to renegotiate that mortgage, they have to sell that, that home, right? So you're purchasing a home, a million dollar house, which where I come from, it doesn't exist. And so you come up to renegotiation and your percentage of interest goes from 1.5 to 4.5 and you effectively are now homeless. And so I kind of saw that I saw this happening. I said, okay, listen, financial prudence is of the most importance because this is only going to last for a short period of time. And you see the weaponization of, of, of debt along with the uh, how short the dopamine loops have become in a man's brain because he has access to all this stuff that he otherwise wouldn't have been able to afford, now effectively getting into a position where the government's arm is so far up his own ass, they're coming out of his eyes. And it, it's effeminate behavior, and it makes men effeminate, which then pushes them to push their wives into the workplace. It's this vicious cycle. And now mm. the government effectively is your daddy. Mm. How can and, you worship God if you're in a position like that? And, and the only way you can do it so many guys ask me like, but you know, how much do I need to earn to have a single earner household and have seven kids in 2024? And they're focused on the wrong thing because they, all they think about is what you guys call offense, but it's the defense that matters more. You have to live more frugally. It's not just about earning more and more and more because there's going to be more going to the tax man and you get stung the higher up you go. If you attack the bottom end with living more frugally, that's how you'll make it work. But no one wants to hear that because they want to get the glitz and the glamour instead. So you got to be so really come careful. On, yep. For li lifestyle inflation is a bitch. Yeah, people yeah. don't realize it. They get into multiple car payments, huge home, all this nice stuff. And I've mm -hmm. had to really draw back in many ways. But the, the, the problem is, is once you get to a certain level, going backwards is incredibly difficult. So just don't go to that level to the first yeah. place. Average car payment is over a thousand, right? In the U.S. now. Is it? Holy yeah, yeah. Crap. I'm pretty sure yeah, it is. I'm pretty sure I heard that the other day. Over a thousand. Um, if <laughs> if you're a young guy listening, thinking about cars, I I would just say get something about three years old with not too many miles or maybe like thirty forty thousand, and try and keep it under about twenty percent of gross income, and just mm -hmm. buy that and just run it into the ground. Keep it for like ten fifteen yeah. years. Yeah, it's a good rule. Yeah, just uh, speaking to some of the. Uh, really great decisions that my dad made with money growing up. Uh, first was he saved for college for my sister and I from, I think like the moment he had a, a real job after he was married, he had many real jobs, but moment after he was married, it was like, all right, here's some fancy multi-letter account thing that you put money into every year. And so by the time I was getting ready to go to college and my sister's getting ready to go to college. He had enough for an undergrad at roughly any university. Um, you know, maybe not if we went into like Harvard or something, but all decent universities. And he's like, I'll pay for the first four years of college. If you guys want to get a master's, you'll have to pay for yourself. Um, 
I went to a film school that cost 13 grand. So that was easy <laughs> for him. Um, so I got out of high school through a trade program with no debt. When I was 17, he paid cash for the same car that I'm driving right now and then signed the deed over to me for $1 because I guess you have to like make it a sale or whatever. So for tax purposes, um, haven't had a car payment for five years, you know, zero debt whatsoever. And then my parents also, um, uh, I, we had some vague concept of like an allowance or whatever, but I, I had jobs, landscaping jobs, dishwashing jobs. And, um, you know, if, if my sister and I ever needed anything, my parents were there financially. My dad was there financially, but if we wanted something that was up to us and, it was drilled into my head from day one. If you don't have the money, you don't get the object. It's just mm -hmm. how it works. There was no, there was no concept of credit. And so eventually this was another, this was another great thing that they did. Um, I did get a credit card and my parents taught me, okay, this, so this is how you're going to pay for gas. That's it. It's just for paying for gas. So as the money is spent, you pay it off immediately and you, you actually have like a, a substantial credit score by the time you're old enough to use it that allowed me to get an apartment because they check your credit score for getting an apartment i have i have friends that don't even have a credit score right now because they've never done this stuff and um if you have to treat it like a game basically like a like a literal boring sims video game and not like it's uh, your life because the moment it's your life, well, you just want to be more comfortable. And so it's like, well, I guess I, I could get like a, a lease on a new car and it's only like $400 a month. And then you multiply that over a bunch of different things. But all this to say for coming into 2024 and leading up to 2030, something I've said for the last couple of years is that I don't believe there's going to be a middle class in the next five years. Uh, I think that for men under 25 right now, I'm talking specifically 16 year olds to 25 year old guys. I think you, you're going to be faced with two options by 2030. Sprinter van, tuna out of a can eating poverty and laptop jobs or you're going to figure out a way to make millions of dollars. But that middle ground, I think, is going to mostly go away because of how rough things are going to be. And there's, it's very possible to be happy in the first category. It's a lot harder to make it into the second category. But if you have time and runway, do your best to do the moonshot. If you're between 16 and 25, try and come up with some NFT or software or whatever idea you have and see if you can make millions of dollars. Because if you don't, you'll just be right back in the sprinter van eating tuna out of a can. <laughs> That's fine. Um, but I I really think that this the middle ground of get like just get some high five figures job. Like if you're making 80k a year and you're hoping for something good by 2030, I'm quite low in optimism. They gave all those I jobs think, to housewives, Nick. They gave them That's all the good. housewives. In the United States, we're giving um, 10 million illegal immigrants a year, some absurd amount of aid and jobs and so on. And then AI, like it's not AI is not going to solve all our problems, but it's going to uh, supplant a substantial amount of the the workforce. I get, I'm not exaggerating. I get sales calls from robots now. From human voiced robot, I got one yesterday at your house, Tim, in the bathroom. Really? Just a sa a salesman. It's an AI voice. It sounds like a human. They have the same pauses in the breath and everything like that. Uh, hey, Nick. Yes, hello. Hey, it looks like you were trying to consolidate some debt. What? What is what is happening right now? And I was like, "You are a fucking robot." And they're like. <laughs> I will put you on the do not call list. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> so the modern financial landscape definitely necessitates some form of entrepreneurship.
I think the younger generation compared to previous yeah. knows this really, really well. The problem is they're trying to moonshot with shit coins on in, in, in the cryptocurrency space or drop shipping and these other fake businesses because they're in Andrew Tate's Hustlers <laughs> University. Stop well, doing that, guys. <laughs> it, it can work. It's just not going to work 999 times out of 1,000. It's true. It's true. And I, I would say like the new six figures – and then there's no exaggeration. I've had some, I've trained some pretty wealthy people over the years, like worth nine and 10 digits. And they said, Mike, you want to live comfortably? Because it's got to be like household income of $250,000 a year or greater. And this was a few years ago. And I'm like, ah, but having some experience in business and in making various amounts of money, he's not wrong. He's not, he's not wrong. It's either, you know, uh, what, what, whatever inflation, interest rates, what, what have you. Living on like that hundred thousand dollar a year coveted salary after taxes is like seventy thousand dollars, depending on where you're at. So you better yeah. double and triple that. But you know, Will, you you make you make a good point. It's like you gotta figure out how much you're gonna make, how much can you live on. Beyond that, the tax man's just gonna eat at it more. So you better be happy. And this could just comes back to what's really grounded me in my journey as a business owner, because I've been in business for myself since I was like twenty one or twenty two, was good stewardship. And part of that is living frugally. And yeah. so, like, mm -hmm. I'm going to honor what I'm able to earn now, what I can, what God has blessed me with, because he's the ultimate provider. And part of that good stewardship is living within those means. And I think you see this, this financial lack of prudence as another byproduct of the absconding father. Do you guys agree? My dad didn't teach me anything about financial prudence. It was my grandfather. He worked in a tannery for years, came home smelling putrid, and his hands were like callous, giant mitts. And, you know, always owned his homes, never had debt in his, his vehicles, always learned to save and invest. And he instilled that in me. Otherwise, I would have been, you know, I would have not, I would not have what I have today. But yeah, definitely a side effect of the absent father. Most things are a side effect of the absent father, probably, <laughs> if you look at yeah, it. Yeah, I, I think effeminacy as well is, is part of the, the crisis of masculinity that people fall mm. for debt and living beyond their means so badly because living frugally is quite tough. Like there are guys out there with stay at home wives on 50 K, but you mm -hmm. probably wouldn't want their life. It, it can be done. And Nick's point about the sprinter van and the tuna. I don't want anyone listening to that, getting a sense of despair because the opportunities to make money have probably never been greater than they are Correct. today. If you've Correct. got a laptop and internet connection, yes, there's nothing stopping you, but mm -hmm. it's really going to test you as a man that you can commit to that and be creative, et cetera. The, the the warning, and this is a line from scripture, this is Proverbs 16, 8. Better is a little with justice than great revenues with iniquity. The temptation is going to be to be Hustler's University. Mm -hmm. The temptation is going to make make him lots of money from something degenerate. That's the Tim trap. And I, Tim and I talk about this a lot too, just looking at the the landscape of success out there and wondering why there seems to be an inverse correlation with virtue and success in the world. Uh, and I think it kind of comes down to, cause God doesn't want to damn you with success. Cause it's, it's mm -hmm. very, yeah. very heavy to have everything that you want. It's you, uh, just look at every, look at every rapper who's ever gotten what they rap about. Like they, they are living in hell. They're about to go to hell. You know what Tyson said about that, right? This is a famous Mike Tyson interview. And he, he talked about being at his peak. And, you know, he's, he has some lines sometimes that just chill you. You can see it in him, in his eyes. And he said, the, the, the devil came for me when I was at my strongest. Yeah, mm. I've seen that. I saw that recently. Ooh. Like, whoo. Very well said. That, yeah. Wow. Past yeah. a certain point, too, the lifestyle difference does not become greater. Like if you're making five thousand dollars a month and you end up making ten or fifteen, that's huge. You go from ten or fifteen to twenty five to thirty. It's big. Past that, it's just extra. But yeah. in order to get that same lifestyle bump, like going from five to twenty or twenty five, you have to be making like a hundred plus a month because at thirty you're not making Lambo money yet. Some guys think it's not. That's not Lambo money. That's not even mm -hmm. close to Lambo money. That's more than Lambo is more than that yearly salary, three hundred sixty grand a year. And so in that, I kind of reached a certain point where I'm like, of course, I'm ambitious. And I, you know, it's a game just like lifting weights is, but it's a trap that you get lost in because not only does your lifestyle inflate to meet where, however much you're making, it's never enough. 
and there's levels to wealth. And so like, it, I, I would say take inventory of the material items that you really hold in high esteem in your heart. Because once you get that Lambo, you're probably going to want the Bugatti. And once you get the Bugatti, I mean, who know what, what is beyond that? Four Bugattis. Well, well that, that's just it. I mean, there, there is, the appetite is insatiable, right? It's no different with promiscuity or Will and I's experience in the gym. It's always five more pounds that you're after until you realize, you know, God, thank you for today, for the ability to show up and train and to pay my bills. And then abundance flows from that. And not just that, but just true gratification from life in general, regardless of how, you, how much you're making. It, it's such a trap, dude. And I've, I've fallen into it so many times. You know, you just, know it's top 1% in the US, I was looking this up, they save about 40% of their income. Top 1% save about 40%. Top 5%, I think it was, save about 15 to 20% of their income. And most mm -hmm. other people are paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. Now, what that tells you is that Mike's point, the jump from top 5%-ish to top 1%, they haven't got stuff to spend that money on. Yeah, All they do exactly. is they just invest it, get compound interest, and then blow people away by the time they're 80, like Warren Buffett, and then yeah. create generational wealth for their sons. But yeah. there's there's only so many Lambos you can buy once you get that wealthy. I th think I just figured something else out, too, with the the hustle mindset. I don't know why I haven't seen this before. Working so hard and and with this hustle and grind andrew tate mindset of making as much money as humanly possible is an elaborate way of never having to tell your woman no <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah that's a good point it's a good point yeah. here's why for those listening who like me only are realizing this right now if you spent a lot of time terrified that eliciting permitting or producing negative emotions in the women in your life would cause them to withdraw you would do everything in your power to make sure that they were always comfortable and happy and if you picture yourself trying to be in a long-term relationship where there's any kind of discomfort because you're not making enough or you're not even close to being comfortable what's what's the woman gonna do how's she gonna look at you is she gonna withdraw is she gonna withhold intimacy is she gonna think less of you so now what do you have to do is make as much money as humanly possible and there's no amount of money that will outpace your fear of abandonment of withdrawal Boom. <clears throat> yeah 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 that's what that's what i i think i said this one time when i went on pearly things channel I was like, I mean, she was talking, I think she said something like, oh, so uh, any, because uh, I said that guys that get a divorce are by definition betas, uh, a beta, the definition of a beta, really, they're more like gammas. They want to be alphas and yet no little wolves follow them, uh, especially the wolf who's supposed to. That's the definition of not an alpha. And She's the pearl threw at me. Okay, so you're telling me um, Donald Trump and Dr. Dre and like Michael Jordan, like like most of them were were black guys, and and I was these guys aren't alphas. Come on, because they are all they'd all they're all rich guys who had had divorces. I was like, a lot of these rich guys are just trying to probably sate their wife's desire, their materialistic wife's desires um, every time they came up. So they never had to say no. So I made the exact same point. And it's like, what's really, really alpha is to start out as a young man, be 20 years old, get a job that doesn't pay so well. Just have your wife at home. You come, you work a hard day, come home to her. She's appreciative for whatever you bring home. It's not much, but you have your little corner of the world, your little apartment. She's hanging flowers in the in the window box or whatever. And she doesn't have to go to work. And she she makes do with what she's given. I mean, think of Maria from Sound of Music, my, my favorite springtime movie to watch. She makes clothes for her and all the kids from the old drapes. That that's a lady. And um, an alpha is the man who heads that kind of lady. 
And so, yeah, material abundance, I agree with Nick, is just a hundred percent of the time used by these PhD guys, pimping hoes and whatever the D is for to uh, never have to say no to a woman. It's the exact yeah. opposite of what you assume it is. And the, the way it's framed, the way early things frame that question, Tim, misses out the fact that those guys get to that level because they cucked and took the Faustian bargain in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they're in that arena with their opportunity because they're not alpha right. and people can't see it. If money measures masculinity independently of anything else, then Kim Kardashian is more masculine than pretty much any guy that you could possibly <laughs> mention. She's more of a man. Yeah. She's a billionaire. Your favorite CEO of whatever company you think is really crushing it. So just remember that. Yeah. Um, this is making me think, though, there's a question 261. What does the seventh commandment forbid? Besides stealing, the seventh commandment forbids cheating, unjust keeping of what belongs to others, unjust damage to the property of others, and the accepting of bribes by public officials. And no. on that point of, you know, people being bought for money, like Mike was talking about in a previous episode, being spiritually gay for pay, that's exactly what that's about. But unjust keeping of what belongs to others. Uh, this is the discussion of a living wage, right? We, we talked about mm. property and patriarchy and what constitutes a living wage for a man who wants to raise a family, have a stay-at-home wife, etc. That's been under discussion by popes and they've been concerned about it for at least about 150 years now, a bit longer. That also is something that's under attack too, not paying fathers a living wage, or if they are, coming at them with a 60% tax rate. Yeah, because that's why it's better to be... Go ahead, Nick, sorry. Just because, yes, because women are in the workforce. Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, that's what it is. And like teens, if it was, if all jobs were basically, if we'd have a clear cut instance. I'm not sure where it, where I shake out on it in terms of requiring it with a command economy because I don't like that. But it would at least be a clear case for all employers have to pay a living wage. Pope Francis would like it. And there, there would be benefits to it, though. Again, I'm not super comfortable with the command economy. If it was just all like men in the economy single or married but that's not what we think when you go to the dollar tree and you see your dollar tree employee you're assuming this is a, a, a teenager or something and you're like okay so do you really have to pay them a living wage to work at the dollar tree or or you know when you see women in the workforce you know they're just augmenting their husband's income do you have to do it? it's complete you can't start the question here you have to start the question by getting women out of the workforce, which will automatically drive wages up, right? Because of supply and demand. If half the workforce left tomorrow, they're going to need their employees. The wages are going to go up. It, it'll be good for everyone. Then you don't even have to have the command economy, basically the the you know collectivist command economy versus um, free market economy discussion because everyone's wages are going to go up so high anyway. And then, and then you get the, and I'm so tired, like I, they have a point, but I'm so tired of hearing these zoomers and these, you know, millennials, whatever, whatever the new generation is coming out of university and complaining that they don't have jobs when they have useless degrees or like most degrees in general, <laughs> like, have you gone outside and looked around you dumbass? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have you observed for a second? You just listened to your boomer grandpa. Well, just save. And, you know, we worked hard back in our day and we were able to pay it off. It's like times have changed. Like, yeah. you know, it, it's like these young people are, are retarded and they're and they're growing up with a blindfold on. And then they come out of university with this useless degree. They're working at a Starbucks barista and they're crying and going viral on TikTok because they can't afford anything. It's like, yes, okay, pay people a living wage. I totally agree, Tim. Half the workforce has got to go. Women shouldn't be in the workplace anyways, straight up. That's that's patriarchy. The other the other point is, um, how about developing a skill? I worked at a Dollar Tree because I was skillless and I needed some money. <laughs> you want to demand more from the marketplace is one of the byproducts of capitalism. Bring something that's worthwhile to the marketplace. If you're expecting to make you know, ends meet, on a W-2, 
I think that's in the U.S. It's a W-2 on a salary. Um, that may not be able to cut it unless you can fleece your lifestyle down. Most men are walking around. They got no skills. They're soft as yeah. baby shit. They look like Ned Flanders. They sound like women. And they they have nothing to offer. And they like they, shiny they, stuff that costs a lot. It, well, exactly. Yeah. And they like touching their yeah. peepees. That's it. <laughs> Mike, they look like Ned Flanders with the sweater on. Remember when he takes the sweater on? You know, oh, that's true. He's all cut that's up. True. He's like got a six pack and, and muscles. That's right. He's yeah. yoked. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah he's secretly yoked. <laughs> I, I want to share a piece of advice for uh, the ladies that I heard from a very close friend of mine that his... His grandma, who I think was late 80s, early 90s when she shared this, uh, shared with his mom before she got married. Um, there was She was going to stay at home and uh, be a stay-at-home mom, my friend's mother. And so the grandmother told her um, how, to be, how to be happy in your marriage for your whole marriage. She said, just don't want anything that Steve can't provide for you. That's well said. That's Steve, and you'll, love you, Steve. And, you'll, and you will never resent him. He'll never be unhappy. Just don't want something that he can't provide for you. And so women, check your appetites. Be honest. Don't lie to yourself, obviously. If you're a woman who's very materialistic, she loves the glitz and glam, you want to be flying around on private jets and going to Dubai or whatever, it's like, okay, know what type of man you want. That's that's some Andrew Tate drop shipper guy. Can you marry a Catholic school teacher and be happy with three meals a day and a small Christmas every year and maybe you guys take a road trip? You need to know that going in. But yeah. un unspoken expectations or premeditated resentments. That's well said. And I think it's worth saying again, I think, Will, you said this, that a billionaire is a worse provider for his family if he's not spiritually leading them and providing for them than the guy that is making 50K a year but is spiritually strong and is a patriarch and then raising them in a godly way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, men, too, that are ambitious, and I say this to myself, too, know that the juice isn't worth the squeeze past a certain point, especially if you have to sacrifice life quality and family quality for that extra earned income because your kids and your wife, they odds are they don't care. It's just like this this question I have to ask myself to attain a higher level of physical strength. Do I really want to go on? Do I really want to go on steroids and risk long term effects because of this invisible dragon on the tinfoil that I'm trying to chase? The answer is no. Yeah, I love how I love. Uh, sorry, Will. Go Tim. I was just I was just going to say, I love how this show is about stealing. And we we were like, at the very first five seconds, we were like, don't steal. Now let's talk about property. <laughs> yeah. Now let's talk about acquiring more shit that people will try to steal from you. <laughs> don't steal. Yeah, yeah. It's a don't steal right. sandwich. Five seconds in the beginning, five seconds at the end. What's up, guys? Um, it's hilarious. I mean, because it's so obvious, right? Like, don't do it. Well, in a way, we're talking about what is stolen from patriarchs to prevent them from actually yeah. flourishing yeah. so we are still on the topic but from our own angle which i was hoping something like this would happen as always yeah. it's better than i imagined it was going to be um yeah. even in eden eve wanted more it's important for guys to remember that about about women you, you're gonna have to set that boundary and <laughs> if 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 you are tate guess what there's still guys who dwarf your income and yep. the, the woman who's with you before you're because you're tate is going to be looking at them thinking they will give more resources. A millionaire is a millionaire, but a billionaire is a billionaire and so on and so on. So you've got to draw the line somewhere. Uh, two little th things at the end I thought were kind of interesting. 262, are we obliged to restore to the owner stolen goods or their value? Uh, yes, whenever we are able. And the little note says, if the owner or heir of stolen goods cannot be determined, the goods or their value are to be given to the poor or pious causes. So even then, you don't just pocket them. I thought that was a good thing to think about, just in case anyone does come across some uh, some lost goods or stolen goods. And then the final one, 263, are we obliged to repair damage unjustly done to the property of others? Yes, we are obliged to. 
then it says a person who has accidentally damaged the property of another through no fault of his own is not obliged to repair the damage unless required to do so by civil law. So if it's accidental damage through no fault of your own, then no obligation unless civil law imposes that. So I just wanted to include those right at the end. So we've covered everything under the seventh commandment in the Baltimore Catechism. But I think we've riffed off the most important ones in a way that I haven't really heard anybody else talk about them. So good job, guys. I know we're doing a shorter show today. Anything final to add? Uh, have a holy good Friday, everybody. I'm beginning a 36-hour fast. If anyone out there wants to join me, I just go from noon today until midnight on Easter. So um, happy Triduum, everyone. Solemn Triduum. Is that water only, Tim? Is water only, yet? Yeah. How many years you been doing that? Last year I did two and a half days and I I told people I wanted to do six days from midnight after Palm Sunday to midnight between, you know, midnight turning Easter, six full days this year. But I was so busy and had been running around driving to DC and stuff that I decided not to. So I've done it two or three years, mm -hmm. um, but at least the 36 hours, sometimes two and a half days. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll do, I'll hit the six day fast at some point, but yeah. This year, I'm just like the 36 hours enough. Yeah. I was wondering anybody listening to that suddenly thinking, I'm doing it 36 hour water fast straight away, never fasted before. What are they likely to experience or expect? Yeah. Um, Hunger. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. You, you know, you, you get a little, if you, if it's your first fast, you get a little freaked out um, around uh, a little after dinner time where you're like, oh, wow when you're realizing I haven't had dinner yet and I'm not going to eat anything before going to bed. And then like, you might get a wave of that at bedtime too. It, uh, to me, it's easy to fast in the morning and lunch. It's just, there's a, you know, start noticing your real psychological connections, your psychological dependencies on food as the light wanes in the day. You're like, well, I've been fasting all day. Half the days I'm so busy. I just forget to eat until three, four, five. And so, um, when it turns three, four, five, and you're like, I'm hungry, six, seven, eight, I'm still hungry. And then you realize at eight, nine, 10, 11, whenever you go to bed, 12, sometimes with me, it's too late, one, two, <laughs> I'm not going to eat anything. And then I'm going to get up and not eat anything that you get a little bit panicked, you know, but um, mm. it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Mm. And your body does roll with the punches. I've forgotten which saint it was. I'm thinking Saint Philip Neri or somebody, some demons are only brought out by fasting. It's a great line. Some oh. demons are only brought out by fasting. It's like you face parts of yourself that normally you would just mask with food or whatever it might be. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, people All right, should guys. try it. Try it. Yeah. Good show. Looking forward to the next one. See you as well. One last, one last thing. One last Go, thing Mike. real quick. Let's reflect on the battle that was won on the cross and the resurrection this weekend. And not just that. Christ is Lord, but he's not just Lord. Christ is king in lieu of just all this dumb shit on social media. Christ is king and always will be king. His reign is supreme. That is all. Amen. Thanks, Mike. I wanted happy to say Mike. happy Easter. I don't want to say it on Good Friday, but um, happy Triduum to all of you three and your families. And uh, I'll send a text to you guys or something. But but God bless everybody out there watching C-Mask and all of your patriarchally beneficial families. Amen, Thanks, bro. Tim. You too. Care, guys. God bless Take you guys. care.